Welcome to the world of large families. Families who are doing their best to buck the trend of falling birth rates. I love children. And the more I have, the more I love it. Have you got white knickers on? Families who never quite know when to say enough is enough. It's a lot of hard work. It's warm me up. Families who get to ten kids and just keep going. It's just like cramped, like ten canaries in a little cage, I suppose. He argues with me, I argue with him. Well, we all argue. Just shark cage do me in. I can't imagine not having licklins running round. But I'd love to have at least another ten. The national average birth rate has reached an all-time low of just 1.6 children per mother. But across the country there are some families who are determined to keep the British end up. Tonight we meet five of these large families to find out how they cope with ten kids or more. It's a total financial nightmare. We have to put aside Mark's wages purely just for the shopping. But why do the parents want so many children and when or if are they ever planning to stop? I did say 42 is the cut-off point. And 42 being our age, not yeah. 42 children. <laughs> Meet the Lewis family from Bournemouth. 48-year-old Pete and 42-year-old Tracy have been married for 23 years and in that time had 13 children. Daughters Carly, Tracy, Sam, Lindsay, Danielle, Chantelle, Charlotte, Georgia, Candice, Shannon, Chasnay, baby Portia Mercedes, and their one and only son, Charles. We never knew the sex of any of our children, but never would I dream actually have 12 girls and one boy. You wouldn't put a bet on it, do you know what I'm You just wouldn't expect, you know, the same parents would have 12 daughters and one son. Today is Dad Pete's 48th birthday and the family are going out to celebrate. But in a house of 12 girls, getting ready throws up some unexpected problems. The biggest nightmare in the house is the, the bathroom. Chateau! The children have all been getting ready to go out tonight and the water has actually run out. That's all we've got left. <laughs> No water. <laughs> so on a day like today, when the suppliers run dry, Tracy has to think on her feet. This is the only water that's actually running because it runs off a different system. I'm going to do it in the kitchen now, it's quicker. Plus you've got them banged to right side, so they can't run off. Hip hip! Hooray! Cheers to you all girls and boys. But life in a family full of teenage girls isn't always so harmonious. We do have our arguments. Will you just get out because you're doing my head in? Good one, you bimbo. Shut up, stop making lies. It's hard to get any peace or any sleep. You've always got someone running around annoying you. <laughs> it does get really loud. The little ones wind up the big ones. All you want to do is sit down, relax, put the telly on, put your feet up but you just can't. When we fight, it's like we're only joking about and we realise it till like five minutes later we like make up. <laughs> Pete used to say the tooth fairy always come, but now we're having so many daughters, the hormone fairy's been. <laughs> Sometimes you think, oh, I just want to get out. And sometimes I do, I just get in my car and just go and escape. <laughs> Meet 48-year-old Aubrey Gilhooley and his partner, 25-year-old Kelly Brentnell. I didn't plan to have a large family at all. It's just happened that way. Aubrey and Kelly, 23 years his junior, have six children together. Twins Sherry and Sherelle, Byron, Lovey, Aubrey Jr and Baby Will. And Aubrey has seven other children from his previous marriage. Lee, Wayne, Becky, Maria, Neil, Luke and Ryan. I never wanted a large family. I wanted kids of my own, but 
I didn't want as many as I had. I don't enjoy it, it's hard work. I mean, we all like an easy life, and it's not an easy life. Dinner time and all that sometimes is quite loud. Because like, like, the babies are rushing for the dinner, and so it's like a school canteen. I'm feeding four, eight, 13 of them, and we're having smiley faces, shepherd's pie, and beans or spaghetti. It's eight quick and easy. Most of the time it's things like this because that's what kids eat. They don't really eat vegetables and meat. Well, my kids don't anyway. It may be quick and easy, but Kelly has to dish up over a hundred dinners every week, which adds up to 5,200 per year. While Kelly feeds the kids, Aubrey tends to the animals. This family of 15 also shared the house with two dogs, two parrots, 18 tropical fish, and at the last count, around 40 canaries. I have lost control at the moment. Um, I have to keep going in the shed and counting them because they're just, for some reason, oversexed, <laughs> breeding like anything. My mates at school uh, say mum and dad are like breeding like rabbits and stuff like that, but it's funny. With neither Kelly nor Aubrey working, they survive on benefits and were allocated a three-bedroom house by the council. But for this super-sized family, it just wasn't big enough. There was 15 of us living in three bedrooms. Like 13 children. Me and Aubrey and two kids used to sleep down here and pack our bed away when we got up in the morning. In this room I had four boys. This room I had three boys and one girl in here. I had another four girls in here. I had Maria, Becky and the twins sitting in this little box room. Crammed in like sardines, Kelly and Aubrey approached the authorities for a solution. After five years, the council decided to pay my next-door neighbours to move out so they could knock it into one house. So we've got seven bedrooms now. Life is easier now, having seven bedrooms. I love it. The pressure may have eased at home, but in part two, we'll see how this family copes on holiday. All pegs up, move. Next time I tell you to do something, you do it. We'll meet the parents who don't know when to stop. 13's not enough. We want another baby. Well, you're called by a crook now, really. And find out what life is like for a single mum of 10. The financial pressure on us is absolutely unbelievable and I can't cope. Organising ten or more kids is no easy task. Getting them up, washed, dressed, fed and off to school every morning is just the start. Looking after a brood this size is a full-time job. Just get them off! But for some parents, that's all part of the appeal. Meet the Wilsons. Dad Mark and Mum Shirley. I've always wanted a large family, even from being little. I knew that's, you know, I was more for the children than going out to work. Um, I didn't quite think 13, um, but then 13's not enough. For her 13 children, Shirley has been pregnant for a total of just under 10 years. Ashley. Ashley, <laughs> that was me. There was a page three bird called Bioli Ashley. If it was a girl, I wanted Bioli, but it came out of the boy, so Ashley. So that's where he came from. <laughs> <laughs> Natasha, Kelly, Jordan, the twins, Chloe. Kieran, Brody. McCauley. Nikita was Elton John. I think it was just on the radio at the time, I think. He was after Nikita. No idea. The last baby he was named after the midwife. Heather Ellis. So his name's Ellis. I had no experience before meeting Shirley of a large family at all. So I had to be persuaded. We got to three and I said, that's enough. I think he was beginning to think, you know, oh, is it going to be harder work? But, you know, gentle persuading. Yeah. It soon works. Every sort of 18 months or so, it, Shirley said, oh, I'm pregnant again. It's 6.30 and to keep the family afloat, Mark heads off for a long day at work. Meanwhile, Shirley begins a 14-hour working day 
of her own. We're running late. Shirley doesn't stop at home to look after the children, then I would have to, which um, I, I, I don't think um, I would enjoy quite as much as going to work. Are you sure? In the morning, getting up and knowing that you needed. I think that's the thing. I can't imagine not having little ones running around, not getting up, running around after kids, clearing up after them. That's my life. Meanwhile, in South East London, another large family have an alternative approach to breakfast time. For Greg and Aggie Clovis and their 10 children, organising a big family is all about teamwork. Quite frequently, you know, when you mention you have 10 children, people's eyes open and, and, and you can see in their minds total chaos, noisy, never get any rest. And when they, they're actually quite surprised, aren't they, when they come to the house. The reality is that, you know, when you have a large family, somebody has to take leadership and there's a natural order by which where people have to wash up and do various jobs. Otherwise, you have chaos. I used to say to the kids, look, you know, if, if you don't do it, I've got to do it. Or your mother has to do it. There's a recognition there that I'm doing a, a favour for my parents. I'm helping them reducing their workload. The Clovis household may be an oasis of calm in the mornings, but for many large families, this tranquility is not so easily achieved. A hundred miles away in Bournemouth, Tracy Lewis is rushed off her feet. I'm brushing your hair, if you like it or not. Good girl. Chantal, where is she? Chantal, come on! Come on, mate! Come on, stop being so stupid this morning. You've been really attentive. I didn't go to bed last night till at least two o'clock this morning. So I was like still trying to fuss around getting all their bits and pieces ready, you know. I've been up since seven o'clock this morning. It takes me a good hour to get them ready to feed them breakfast and get them dressed. And then it's another hour really, dropping them off to school. Candice, you wait there. Candice. Come on. Two more schools. <laughs> bye Georgia, bye Charlotte, see you later. <laughs> bye Chantal. Bye. I think she's having a bad morning. Once you got more to school, come back with Portia. Obviously, there's still the washing to do, the dishwasher to put on, tidy through the house, sort of thing. I could definitely wash for England. Two washing machines are on the go all the time. It's a job in itself. This washing machine is actually going to be going on all day and all night. It's basically as fast as you can feed them. They only ever last 12 months. Um, burn the motors out, all the bearings actually go on the machines. And the same with the tumble dryer, they don't last either. You can imagine how much clothes 12 daughters have got. The underwear, the bedding, the nightwear, um, normal clothes. And that's why I've always got so much washing. So I'll never, ever <laughs> be on top of it, I don't think, you know. The kids may be at school, but Tracy has no time to put her feet up. She spends at least 40 hours a week on housework alone. We're like the manager and the manageress of a hotel, you know, and it's just got to, if you don't, if you don't run it properly, it doesn't happen. Mid-morning in Lincoln, Shirley Wilson is off to the shops to pick up a few essential groceries. We shop just the same as everyone else, but just pound more in. Eight pizzas and six garlic breads, that will do one meal for us all. On average, we need five to six loaves a day, uh, pints of milk, at least 20 pints a day. It is hell of a lot, really, isn't it? 
The average British family spends £90 a week on food, but with, amongst other things, 500 bags of crisps, Shirley's weekly bill is slightly higher. We have to put aside Mark's wages purely just for the shopping. That's £347.80 then, please. Tyler, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Wilsons make ends meet with a combination of Mark's salary as an electrician and a family allowance of £122 a week. There is a pressure on me to provide. Um, the fact that there's 15 of us to earn money for can be quite uh, sort of daunting, but you, you've just got to plan ahead the best you can and, and sort of make, hopefully, you know, you, you, I keep on going to work and, and keep on earning the money. For Pete Lewis, financing his family is also a constant challenge. Having 13 children is a total financial nightmare, you know. There's no, no shying away from that at all. Um, and it's huge responsibility. You are constantly forward planning on a daily basis. The never-ending strain on his wallet is not just about putting food on the table. His latest headache has been the phone bill. If you've got a landline phone in the house, unguarded, it gets abused one month. I had a letter from BT to say that the phone calls had gone up to £500 per month. Obviously, there's so many of us girls, and we like be ringing up our boyfriends and <laughs> ringing up our friends, and the bill just was horrendous. The only way forward was to take that phone out and put a payphone in. If I measured it up for one month of use and opened it up, there certainly wasn't £500 in it. So it slowed them all down and uh, hopefully it's keeping the phone bill down. Back in Orpington, money is an even bigger concern for the Gilhooley family. Neither Kelly nor Aubrey work. Instead, they claim nearly £300 a week in benefits. However, they are quick to counter any claims of playing the system to their advantage. Well, I think everyone's got their own opinion, but I don't think they should criticise everyone as the same, all being sponges off the social or whatever, because it's not like that at all. These people that criticise, yeah, that's basically because they don't know us. You know, I dare them to come and stand out there and say what they've got to say. People think, like, having a big family is disgusting, but it's not. Like, it's just like having two two kids, but, like, times it by, like, five or six. It's not, it's not, it's not bad, no. It's like, I, I don't really care what people say. As well as having their rent paid, the Gilhooleys receive £50 a week income support, £109 family allowance, and £140 to care for 12-year-old Ryan, who has learning difficulties. Ryan has a disability which it does need constant looking after. He wears everybody out, and I'm really the only one that can control him. No, 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 go back to the iron. I do want to get back to work because I am a working man. But with the kids off school for six weeks, the Gilhoolies are going on vacation. With an average two-week holiday for a family of four costing around £1,500, with 13 kids, going abroad is out of the question. So instead, they head just 50 miles down the Kent coast. But even this doesn't come cheap. Well, this holiday, because we've got, had to pay for two pitches and to park two cars, worked out £500 for two weeks. Someone go over that corner. It is that expensive. Corner takes us all year to save up for holiday. But despite their best efforts, after feeding and entertaining all the kids, the holiday costs closer to £2,000. And it's not just a strain on their savings. I kept saying you've got to watch the back end, and you was over the back end. No, you can't have it like that. Pegs up. Oh, pegs up. Move. Next time I tell you to do something, you do it. In Derby, holidays are out of the question for 45-year-old single parent Dorna Upchurch, who is struggling to bring up her family of 10 on her own. The financial pressure on us is absolutely unbelievable. Clothing, decent food, electricity, um, gas, 
you pay your mortgage, you pay this, that and the other. Do you know something? If all my fears could, could end if I could afford a pound ticket on the lottery, I can't even afford to do that. Lots of love and what? Donna and her husband, Gary, had worked hard to balance the cost of bringing up 10 kids. But when Gary died a year ago, the financial consequences of such a large family were exposed, as Donna now had to cope on her own. Today is the first anniversary of his death. It just brings everything flooding back. We just sort of try and support each other the best way we can. And being here today, you know, it, it's not something we really enjoy. It's just something I th think we feel we have to do. Because he was a great husband and a fantastic father. My daddy was God who knew all things, and better than Santa with gift he'd bring. I knew his voice before I could speak, and I loved it when he could sing me to sleep. He taught us life's lessons of right and wrong, and installed us values that might be strong. And so through the years, like a hero, he stood, working to give us all that he could. I love you so very much, Daddy. He got cancer, and he absolutely broke his heart. And he said, I don't want to die. There was so much more I wanted to do. We had an appointment then at the DRI cancer place, and my husband said, how long? And he said, well, I'll be grateful for each and every day that I can give you. He was 13 stone, six foot two. And in the end, he was five stone. I used to lift him in and out of the bed as if he was one of my children. And uh, he died Sunday at 12.30 at night in my arms. Actually, in my arms. It's so, it's, it's so hard, really, it's hard to cope with it. I know, but it's hard when you've got 10 constant reminders, you know. They're very strong boys, you know. They're doing really well when they're together, and when they're alone, I try and be there as much as I can for them. I feel that because my husband has died, my kids are having to suffer tenfold. The fact they've lost the father, the fact that they've lost the respect of the fact that mum and dad was working and they could have the nice things like other children have, they've lost all around. You think you're taking a look around at yourself and you think, God, what am I going to do? You know, I'm not going to have that money, I'm not going to be able to pay the mortgage, I'm not going to be able to do this, the kids are going to have to go without. I nearly lost the house earlier this year, as it was. And I can't cope. I really can't cope on the money. It's something has to go. Despite all her worries, in part three, Dawna still dreams of having more children. You don't want I mean, my husband definitely wanted to have more children, and that would be exactly the same with any other partner I ever chose to have, because children are my life. 44-year-old mother of 13, Shirley Wilson, is also determined to keep going. I must have done millions of pregnancy tests, but I really am hoping this time. But we'll see. And the Gilhoolies try a radical new method of birth control. I don't worry about falling pregnant because we sleep in separate rooms. It's the best form of contraceptive, isn't it? Hello? It has always been Shirley Wilson's ambition to have as many babies as possible. And with husband Mark, so far she's reached 13. But it could have been a different story. When we first got married, we obviously, like any other couple, wanted children. So after a couple of years when Shirley hadn't become pregnant, we said, well, there must be a problem. After fertility tests, doctors discovered Shirley had cysts on her ovaries which were preventing her from ovulating regularly. I did at one time think there would be no children. You begin to think that you're not normal like other women and I would look at other people's children in the pushchair. I mean, I know this is, probably sounds wrong, but I would think, well, you know, 
Well, I could give that one a better life. I could take that one. I mean, now I would be absolutely devastated to think that I could even think like that. But it's surprising what goes through your head when you're trying for so long. Desperate to get pregnant, Shirley had an operation to remove the cysts, but she still needed a hormone treatment to induce ovulation and enable her to conceive. And that was when it happened, like, you know, she became pregnant for the first time, but it taken us from getting married four years. After finally giving birth to her first child, Shirley has had 22 further pregnancies, but 10 of these have ended in miscarriage. I do sometimes think about the ones that I've lost. It sounds stupid in a way. It's made me more determined that I will have another. I will prove that, you know, I am capable of having another. I like this stage the best, really, because there's a sense that they need you, that, um, that when they fall over the cry, it's the one they want. It's that sense of being wanted. Obviously, Ellis is getting older. He is growing up and we're going to school soon. So I'm just not ready myself to say that's enough. Um, I suppose I'm not ready to be made redundant. It's, this has been my job for 20 odd years. And I suppose while I can still do it and I feel I'm a good mum, then I can't see why I should give up. In Derby, 45-year-old Dorna Upchurch, despite the financial hardship caused by the death of her husband, is also keen to add to her brood. In all walks of life, you've got categories. You, you know, you've got those that want one, those that want two, half a dozen, and then you've got the eccentrics, like in everything, which is me. I love children, and the more I have, the more I love it. I'd love to have at least another ten. I would hate it if I didn't have any brothers or sisters because it would be so boring. Like next door, she's on her own. Sometimes, sometimes. Or she does well, play with the dogs. It's always been when they started going to nursery or school, really. But it's like, bye, mum. See you later. And I'm, I'm there, and I'm thinking, oh, my little baby's gone to school. I need another baby. I've got to have another baby. Ow. If I could, you know, if. Things worked out for us. If I obviously had another new relationship, I would like at least another ten. I really would, without a doubt. I mean, my husband definitely wanted to have more children, and that would be exactly the same with any other partner I ever chose to have, because children are my life. Back in Lincoln, the prospect of more children for Shirley Wilson is still in the balance. She has resumed hormone treatment and is once again trying to get pregnant but she's not finding it easy. Normally within three months I've already uh, conceived, but this time it doesn't seem to be working like it normally does, but that could be my age. We want another baby, by hook or by crook now, really. Um, and um, we, we'll do our best, you know, any way we can to get that. At nearly 45, Shirley is worried that she may no longer be able to conceive, so she's booked a blood test to check she's still ovulating. Hello. How are you? All right, thank you. Have a seat. Thank you. Okay then. Oh, yes, it does look good. <laughs> it looks fine. So, how are you feeling generally? I just want to know now. I just mm. need to know one way or the other. It's no good trying every month open. How old's the eldest one now? She's nearly 21. And the youngest one's nearly two. Gosh. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Brave lady. <laughs> Brave or silly. <laughs> and it's time to be done. We've got to know one way or the other, just for peace of mind, really. And hopefully that it'll all come back OK. If not, uh, be hard saving and just go for the next step, whatever there is, whatever's out there, we're willing to take. We'll not give in until people refuse to, to help us. And as long as there's people out there willing to help us, then we'll take the chances that they're willing to give us. Big <laughs> go. Back in Bournemouth, Tracy and Pete Lewis have no such worries. Just had some exciting news. Um, obviously, I was so ecstatic to find out that I was actually expecting my 14th baby. And I was so excited. I couldn't believe it. I went downstairs and told Pete straight away. And um, I just couldn't believe it. Today is Tracy's 12-week scan to check the health of her baby. At 42 and after 13 previous births, 
there is a far greater risk of problems during pregnancy. See all the other children. That's what you've got to contend with. <laughs> okay. I just, can you just help me just by holding yeah. that up? That's great. Okay. Okay, Tracy. You can hear the baby's heart beating there. It's about twice the rate that ours normally beat out. Okay, Tracy, so your baby looks entirely anatomically normal. Yeah. Um, everything appears to be there that we could expect to see at this, at this early time of the pregnancy, and it appears to be in the right place. So that's a really good start. Oh, that's very reassuring for myself because obviously, being an older mum, I thought my body was starting to wear itself out, sort of thing. And in the back of your mind, just worrying if everything's going to be okay, you know. So it's really lovely and it's a positive, you know. Okay. Now, yeah, Tracy, there's some pictures oh, of you, baby. Thank you very much. That's really so lovely. So put those in your photo album. <laughs> yeah. In Lincoln, it's been a week since Shirley Wilson had her blood test, and she's anxious to find out the results. Oh, hello, it's Mrs. Wilson. Bring in for some results. Thank you. Blood test 27th of June shows high likelihood of ovulation. All right. Oh, that's good, isn't it? That's. So it's a high likelihood. All right. Yeah, good news. Oh, I'm well pleased. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye. A high likelihood of ovulation. Yeah, so that means then, obviously... Spot on. Still ovulating. Still ovulating. Yeah. Well, I'm a bit more pleased Upbeat, at the yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, everything's still fine. Your body's not packed up yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> Unlike Shirley, the Gilhoolies never planned any of their children, so the last thing on Kelly's mind is to have more babies. For my first pregnancy, I found out I was having twins. I was shocked. But two weeks after I found out I was having twins, I gave birth to them and I was only 23 weeks. And uh, I only weighed one pound 12 each. And I was in intensive care for four months. Nearly lost them quite a few times. I can't look at their photos. I can't sit there and look at all their baby photos without crying because it's too much memories. Even though they're here, like part, part of me died when they were born. Really horrible it was. After I had the twins, I was on the oral pill and the injection pill, and we was using contraception, but we were still falling pregnant. Still falling pregnant. Four more kids later, 25-year-old Kelly has decided enough is enough, and the couple have resorted to a more traditional form of birth control. Well, we're not having no more children. I don't worry about falling pregnant, because we sleep in separate rooms. It's the best form of contraceptive, isn't it? Hello? They may be sleeping in separate beds, but Kelly still doesn't want to take any chances. About four years ago, I decided I wanted to be sterilised, um, but my GP wouldn't send me to see a consultant. He said I was too young. Um, obviously, I've been harassed him for the last few years, and if Finally, a couple of months ago, he said that he would send me to see a consultant to get sterilised. So I'm waiting to see a consultant now. So hopefully I'll get sterilised very soon. It was the steak and the bread. I think it was hard just for Whilst Kelly is willing to surgically terminate her natural fertility, Catholic parents of ten, Greg and Aggie Clovis, take a more pro-life stance to having children. Religion is the most important part of our lives. There's no doubt about that. It's essential, and from that, our whole philosophy in life stems, really. Father, Son of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our faith teaches us that the marital act has two dimension for love and life. It's for bonding, it's for couples to increase their love and affection towards each other, also for procreation and having children. Our beliefs are key to how we operate with our children. We bring up our children as Catholics, as Christians, and that therefore how they relate, how they behave, the decisions they make inevitably will come back to that. I want to become a priest when I'm older because I enjoy the religion and I like going to Mass and surfing at Mass. They may be lonely but I, I think it's quite a good life. They, sometimes I have barbecues and raffles. 
I still very firmly believe in my faith in, in God and, and in the Catholic Church's teachings and live my life now by those teachings. So they're exactly the moral standings that you kind of want to grow up with and, and that I will be in, putting upon my kids as well. When they first got married, Greg and Aggie gave little thought to family planning. Now the church has always taught consistently <laughs> that to use birth control, which frustrates the reproductive system, is morally wrong. We've always accepted the church's teaching, uh, certainly that birth control, steroid-based methods, um, barrier-based methods, to use them actually is, um, uh, is intrinsically evil. Without contraception, Aggie gave birth to their first five children in just five years. Wanting to then plan any further pregnancies, they sought a solution which didn't go against their religious beliefs. The actual method which we use primarily helps the couple to um, identify the fertile parts of the cycle, which tends to be quite short. They tend to be somewhere between three and five days. So what it does, it helps them to identify those days and they can actually actively choose to have a child, choose to conceive or choose to avoid conception. The SAFE method is based on this slide rule device. It's called a fertility evaluator. There are observations a woman would take, sensation, her mucus clarity and mucus texture. And by simply adjusting the evaluator, it gives her a value which is called a level of indication of fertility. It's an indicator how fertile she is at any particular day in a cycle. And what typically happens is the husband actually will do the charting. He'll say to his wife, can you give me a value for your sensation, your mucus clarity and texture? And she'll say, well, I kind of feel a little damp, mucus is cloudy and stretchy. And he will be able to know whether you're fertile or not. The method has proved so reliable that they've evenly spaced their remaining five children over a period of 10 years. Sure of its virtue, they're passing it on to their own children. In our generation, I think we're probably the first, the first, plus another group that are using it, and it seems to be working, working really well for us. I've got one child at the moment, and myself and my wife are planning on having uh, four or five kids. I don't think I'd quite go as far as uh, having ten kids. That I mean, I'm not, I, I wouldn't dismiss it equally. I have as many kids as uh, God permits. I think our generation seems to be incredibly hostile to moral ethics. You know, everybody should be able to do everything they want to do, irrespective of the costs and the consequences. And that doesn't make any sense to me. In Lincoln, the Wilsons have been encouraged by the news that Shirley still has a chance of conceiving and are doing all they can to increase their tally to 14. It's been several months on the Clomid and for the first time I am now late. I must have done millions of pregnancy tests, but I really am hoping this time, really desperate. Oh, I hate this term, I hate this bit, but we'll see. No. It's supposed to be two lines for, yeah, one for them. There you go. But I'm beginning to get used to that now, really. You know, that sort of thing, well, it's going to be now. But... Is it disappointing? Mm. Yeah. I suppose even though you know that it might come back now, there's always that. I suppose you always want it and think that it's going to be, yeah, you know. I think I'd be more shocked if you come back, yeah. But it's still disappointing when they come back now. Um, you say you don't get your ropes up, but you do. Yeah, you do. Refusing to be beaten, in part four, Mark and Shirley seek help from a fertility expert. Can you offer us anything at all? Things go from bad to worse for Dorna Upchurch. I had my kids to look after them not the other way around, and that's all they seem to have done just lately. And the Lewises break their news to the family.
In Derby, mother of 10, Dorna Upchurch, is in a financial crisis. Since the death of her husband, she has struggled to make ends meet on her own, and now her home is under threat. Whatever savings we ever had, I had to, to use to pay the couple of months' mortgage, and then there was just absolutely nothing left. And it just got worse and worse. And all these letters here are from courts, stating they're going to repossess. I mean, I haven't made August. I'm definitely not going to be able to make September's. So they are going to take the house, and I know it. We've lost everything, and I'm broken. It's absolutely broken me. I had my kids to look after them, not the other way around, and that's all they seem to have done just lately. And that's more or less it. We've lost everything. Mark and Shirley Wilson have been using a hormone treatment to help them have their 14th baby. But at nearly 45, Shirley is failing to conceive. As a last throw of the dice, they're heading to a private hospital in Birmingham for a consultation with an IVF specialist. Mr. and Mrs. Wilson. The ovulation test you had was a progesterone level. Mm -hmm. Yes. That tells you that you are at least going through the motions of releasing an egg. Yes. But you're aware a woman is born with all her eggs. You don't mm -hmm. make any yeah. new eggs. Yeah, that's right. As you get older, they go off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's quite simply. <laughs> what is perhaps now the, the, the important issue is what indeed could you do that might help you to get pregnant? I probably have to be fairly blunt about that. Realistically, the chance of a successful pregnancy with IVF is about zero. Can you offer us anything at all? In practice, I think the only thing that would be egg donation, generally speaking, clinics in this country will have up to a two-year waiting list for donated eggs. Mm -hmm. It's almost unethical to put more people on the waiting list because the wait is now so unpredictable and long. I can't see anything that's practical that's really going to offer you a realistic no. chance. It's no, just we, clutching at straws. I mean, you obviously look after your children brilliantly, you know. Um, but, you know, nature is nature. As a doctor, I can't do much to help nature. Ah, yeah, never mind. Come to terms with this, Ellis being the last one, um, I think will be very hard. It's something I've got to do. Um, I just think we'll both find it hard. Yeah, yeah. It, it had to come, but uh, it, it, it's, it's going to... It's going to take some getting used to and getting over. Life's got to go on, is not it? There's still 13 more need looking after. Um, and who knows one day, the grandchildren will come along. We might as well go home now, people. Let's go. In Bournemouth, Pete and Tracy Lewis are about to break their news to the family. Children, let me watch you all indoors, please. Good girl. Um, sit down, stay sat down, please. Mum and Dad, it's got some very exciting news. Do you want to know? Yeah. Don't keep you guessing. We're not getting married. Mummy and Daddy's already married. Yeah, quiet, I'm gonna tell you. Right. Once I've got a hush, right, you can be quiet and tell me. One, two, three. I'm having a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. Oh my god. Jasmine, really you're gonna have a brother or sister. Shall I show you? Look, what's this? Where's it due, Mum? Oh, that lovely? Um, Look, she's shocked, bless her little heart. It would have to be a boy. You'd like a boy, would you? Not a boy, Shan. Not a boy, Shan. Boy, Shan. Yeah, I'd love a little brother, but, you know, that's very unlikely to happen. So it would have been a bit of a shock to the whole family. And I think they're all excited and obviously can't wait to have a little newborn baby and back into the house because we haven't had one for a couple of years. I didn't think that they would. I just thought they would stop at number four. Are we on their team? <laughs> all right, yeah. <laughs> 
probably is a crossroads in terms of our life. Um, it's probably time for us to shut up shop and uh, focus on the large family that we have. And uh, Tracy's not getting any younger. <laughs> A month after receiving her eviction notice, single parent Dorna Upchurch has decided to move the family to Great Yarmouth. And to help her rebuild her life, she's also found new companionship with a close friend. I've known Harry for 18 years. 17 years. 17 years. She needed help, she needed someone to support her, a shoulder to cry on, stuff like that. That's all it was at first. And then it's things just developed. I just got so used to you being there and I kept missing you every time you wasn't, didn't I? And I'd realised that I'd fallen in love with Harry. I don't have any problems with large families. I like large families. I've got six of my own children. Between them, Dorna and Harry now have a total of 16 kids but they still believe there's room for more. Hopefully, if everything goes according to plan, we will have another child, if I don't get too old. Yeah, what do you mean too old? And that will be it. It's not too, it's, how can you say you're too old? Well, I'm 56 now. Well, you're not the one that's having it, it's me. You're never too old to have a child. To be quite honest with you, one's not enough. I'd like more than one, definitely. Mm. Twins, no, no. Well, yeah, twins would be nice, but there'd, there'd still come a time when I'd want another one after the twins, you see. So we'd have to have one first, then wait a couple of years and then have another. And then maybe stop, maybe. Yeah? Whatever. <laughs>